Um, okay, hello everyone to the fourth Deacon Seminars meeting. Uh, I'd like to welcome Professor Dr. Laura Vandenbosch uh, of the School for Mass Communication uh, Research at KU Leuven. Uh, so the core of research uh, of Professor Vandenbosch is the relationship between media and well-being. Uh, and topic on which she's published in a range of journals with angles from psychology and sexology to communication theory. Uh, Professor Van der Bosch is an editorial member of several reputed journals. She's involved in several research projects. And in 2019, she's received an ERC grant for research on the effects of contemporary media uh, on adolescents' well being. Uh, so uh, I think it will be a very interesting presentation. Uh, we'll have a, probably a, an approximately 40 minute presentation, 30 40, followed by time for questions. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Professor and uh, Professor Van den Bosch agreed to take questions during the presentation. Also, if you need anything clarified, just uh, I think you can just unmute your mic and uh, go ahead. Uh, so, thank you very much uh, for coming. And uh, Professor Van den Bosch, the floor is yours. Hi, good uh, afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Laura van den Bos, but of course you can call me Laura. Um, and I'm happy and excited to tell you today a bit more about the work we've done on uh, media use and youth's body image. Um, maybe to give you some background about uh, the overall research I'm involved in. This is my research team here at KU Leuven. Um, I'm currently supervising or co-supervising a group of 10 PhD students, and they all share their focus on media effects in young people, yet uh, they approach it uh, from very, very different angles. Um, with some of them working uh, from more uh, a perspective of, for instance, vocational aspirations in which they uh, especially uh, look how media is shaping youth's vocational aspirations and so the professions they would like to do. And of course, we also uh, focus here on, on STEM professions and the well-known gender gap in these topics. Um, another PhD student of mine is working on political socialization, in which we especially target entertainment media and see how they um, more indirectly socialize certain political values, attitudes and beliefs in youth. Um, some other PhD students are working around mental well-being, and here it's more about um, yeah, how social media can at some days, uh, on some days, um, feel, uh, make people feel better about themselves, while on other days it makes them feel rather sad, and we try to understand how this is happening. And then finally, some of our research is more in the health context in which we target health behavior, and for instance, with the recent uh, COVID pandemic, um, we investigated which kind of media outlets supported adolescents to uh, follow the measures that prevent a COVID infection and which media outlets uh, were rather um, inspiring them to uh, violate the measures. Um, for myself, I've done my PhD at KU Leuven. After that, I've uh, uh, visited some other universities. I did uh, a research stay at the University of Toronto and did a postdoc at uh, the University of Amsterdam to then again return uh, to my first university to become here uh, an assistant professor um, in which I am uh, mostly focused on research. Um, but today I will talk about the research that we're doing in the field of body image and so how social media uses, uh, but also television viewing relates to youth's body image and this work is primarily based uh, to the studies that I've done together with uh, my PhD students Shelley Maas and Orfa Delenne, which you can find uh, or their pictures are uh, circled uh, in this slide. Um, so maybe to kick off something about uh, body image, what is body image? Uh, body image relates to how you think and feel about your body. This can be about your um, 
your body, but also, of course, about your skin or your face or all other appearance related uh, attributes. A negative body image is expected uh, to be viewed as a kind of a distortion of the perception behavior of cognition related to weight or shape. Um, this image takes uh, quite some time in, um, oh, sorry, um, takes up quite some time uh, with young people. Um, it's also not a stable image. Your body image can change over time, even uh, over days. And so a lot of people, and especially young people, spend uh, quite some time in reflecting about their body image um, or in investing uh, appearance-related behaviors. This can take uh, the shape of exercising, but you can also think about applying makeup or styling your hair. All of these activities are related to your body image. For some people, this body image is, uh, is negative. Um, in a recent study in 2020, we found that actually 60% of girls and 35% of girls indicated that they're not completely satisfied or rather dissatisfied with how they look. Um, this, this is dissatisfaction about one's appearance is, of course, uh, one of the causes of eating disorders or um, unhealthy sporting behaviors, unhealthy fitness behavior with boys, um, which is still a severe threat among young people. Um, because um, we see, for instance, in Belgium, that uh, with adults, uh, a bit less than 10% um, still develops uh, an eating disorder. So I think the numbers are still somewhat um, disturbing. Um, why do we focus on youth and why are they uh, so often dissatisfied? So 60% of girls, but 35% uh, of boys. So we do see that there's an imbalance in how many girls are dissatisfied and how many boys. Well, it's not um, yeah, surprising, let's say, that, that there's such a group, big group of, of adolescents dissatisfied. When you also look at the developmental period they're facing. They're facing a lot of changes in adolescence regarding their body and uh, they need to cope with these challenges that the changes bring along. So we see, uh, first of all, biological changes coming up um, in which their primary and secondary sex characteristics change. Um, their skin also changes, they receive acne, they grow and they have to learn to accept these new body features. So their appearance also really changes during adolescence. At the same time, their cognitive reflection skills are also moving. They are better equipped to more abstract thinking, which means they can observe themselves from another perspective. And they also have to uh, yeah, develop a kind of body image identity for themselves and they use their new cognitive skills for them for this and this is why body image is also yeah, increasingly important um, in adolescents because they have increased skills to reflect about how they feel about their own and others appearances and of course this this is also um, connected to the context in which they are growing up so the psychosocial um, inputs they receive while growing up. And here we see that um, their peer group attaches also a lot of importance to appearance. And this is sometimes even called the appearance culture in peers among adolescents and late uh, adolescents. Um, peers are not the only one who are focusing on appearance. This is also um, the case for a lot of media content. Um, and media content is popular during adolescence. On average, uh, youth still watch approximately two hours of TV a day, and they use social media actually throughout the day continuously. So it's hard to, to really put a time 
uh, on, on the uh, amount of minutes that they're scrolling or posting things on social media, but it's it, it generally said that they're using it throughout the day. Um, and these media seem to promote um, a specific type of appearance. So it's not, not a diversity of appearances, but they seem to favor one type of appearance. And this kind of appearance is, is described in the literature as the appearance ideal. Um, and it has four characteristics. Um, and these characteristics you can use uh, to recognize um, the image actually, um, that the appearance ideals. So the first is, is body fat. Uh, in which uh, most popular media characters, and here we're thinking about influencers or television characters, have uh, almost no body fat. Um, for instance, uh, one of the studies on reality television programs found that 50% of men had uh, low body fat, while in reality, two times as many men have uh, actually body fat. Um, you found the same in, in, in content analyzing, analyzing the female characters that are shown on TV. And here it's even uh, more uh, significant or it's even a larger proportion of uh, female characters that has barely uh, body fat with 75% uh, of the female characters um, showing no body fat. And this is uh, three times as often as it is in reality. Um, similar numbers are noted for influencers. Um, the second characteristic to which you can uh, identify, to which you can recognize uh, appearance ideals, is the body shape. They share uh, a, a certain shape in how their body looks like. So it's not only the low body fat, but it's also for women, it's that they are thin, with but with a well-shaped bust, small hips, and low body fat. Um, a typical example in times of social media is, is Kim Kardashian, who is well known for her uh, low body fat, but well-shaped bust um, and hips. Um, for men, it's of course different. For men, it's the uh, mesomorphic ideal that is uh, relevant um, and in which for especially the muscular arms and the broad uh, shoulder chest and athletic legs are, are characteristic to recognize them. Um, a third characteristic is the face and hair of appearance ideals um, as Typically, the face is spotless, like you do not see any acne or pimps uh, on these uh, promoted faces. Um, plus, you also see um, some typical hairstyles. And here, it's also rooted in, in um, racial stereotypes, because especially hairstyles typical for a Caucasian model are favored above other uh, more ethnic diverse hairstyles. Um, plus, maybe for men also, um, a lot of hair is favored uh, in comparison to uh, a more bold type, um, which is seen as less part of the appearance ideal. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, and then the final characteristic is skin tone, in which um, a sun-kissed skin for uh, Caucasian characters with uh, a lighter skin for uh, darker characters is favored in most uh, media content. Uh, again, that are more um, exceptional characteristics uh, from reality. Uh, and that is what, what all of these characteristics share, actually, is that they are somewhat a bit more unrealistic uh, in comparison to reality. Um, plus, you see them repeated across different media contents, whether you scroll down a popular magazine uh, with a lot of fashion ads, or whether you watch uh, one of the most popular shows on Netflix, or you watch the most popular influencers on social media, you'll see that these characters seem to reoccur, and thus together they promote a well-defined uh, appearance ideal that is quite narrow in its interpretation of what is beautiful and what is not. The literature has um, agreed that some 
media users who come across these appearance ideals may respond with body dissatisfaction. This is not always the case. So it is only uh, believed to occur when uh, media users respond with two types of, message, of, of processes. And the first is called the internalization of appearance ideals, while the second uh, is labeled upward comparison processes. I will now explain more in depth what each of them mean. So for the internalization of appearance ideals, it's important um, to highlight that this uh, process means that you go further than just acknowledging that appearance ideals exist in the society. So it goes beyond a mere awareness that women should, for instance, be thin while men should be muscular. It is actually the internalization of these ideals for one's own appearances. So you really embrace them within your own identity. And you start to believe that it is not actually the society, but you yourself who wants to aspire these ideals. So it, they really become part of your identity and who you are. So you start to reflect uh, in case of women that uh, part of who you are is that you are thin, have a smooth skin and a well-shaped body. For men, it is part of your identity that you're muscular with a, um, a smooth skin and, and a lot of hair. So it really becomes part of who you are. That's the internalization of appearance ideals. You start to use um, the, the norms promoted in media for who you are. The second process, the internalization, uh, the, the upward comparison processes are part of uh, the social comparison theory. That is a well-known theory in psychology. And this theory actually describes the human drive to automatically compare themselves with their peers to understand their position in the social order. So the theory states that we all have this natural drive to compare ourselves with others to better understand who we are and how we perform. And this theory um, is used to understand how people respond to the appearance ideals they uh, encounter in media. Uh, in one of our study, we found that um, these comparisons are there because we found that 50% of youth um, indicates that they compare themselves with um, the influencers they encounter on social media. When you start comparing yourself with these media figures, you can go um, in two directions. You can have an upward comparison process or a downward comparison process. An upward comparison process takes place when you see the model to which you're comparing yourself to as superior to who you are. And so in the case of appearance ideals, this is basically mostly the type of comparison that um, happens because yeah, the models are typically perceived as superior to how uh, a normal person, uh, an average person looks like. Um, while a downward comparison would manifest itself if uh, the model is believed to be uh, underneath you in the comparison ladder. Um, but this is not uh, the typical case for uh, a comparison with a, an appearance ideal. And so if we have an upward comparison uh, process taking place, we could still have two outcomes. Like you see the model that is superior to yourself, and then you can have two types of responses when seeing how the model, for instance, is more thin than you, has a smoother skin than you, has a better hairstyle than you. Uh, you could either be feel inspired and feel like uh, you like to modify yourself and, and feel motivated to become as beautiful as uh, the media ideal, or you can feel dissatisfied, dissatisfied with how you look. You can feel envy to not be as beautiful as uh, the model is. And it's actually the latter process outcome of envy, dissatisfaction, uh, that we find the most uh, in, in studies testing uh, the effects of uh, social media. Um, 
you can sometimes see this this comparison processes um, manifesting themselves literally in the comments that you users post uh, to famous influencers uh, pictures online in which they they say like you're so beautiful I can't take it I'm not like that um, while others respond but please stop comparing yourself um, a recent study further um, highlighted that these comparison processes uh, especially occur when, when, of course, being uh, very much confronted with these highly idealized media ideals. And uh, for instance, when you're scrolling through Facebook, which is much less known to uh, promote such kind of idealized uh, appearance processes, this occurs uh, much less uh, frequently than, for instance, when using uh, a highly visually oriented platform like Instagram. But of course, you can still ask like, um, but isn't it like that, that especially those dissatisfied uh, users who are unhappy with their appearance go and seek out um, such posts on social media, such appearance ideals on television? So the typical the chicken or the egg questions that we actually often see uh, happening in uh, media research has also been asked in this field uh, in media and body image research. And here the answer, whether it is the chicken or the egg, uh, somewhat differs depending on which medium we're talking about. So the first is, is TV viewing. And as you all know, TV viewing is, is more like a passive activity. It, it, it doesn't require a lot of input of the user itself. Um, you do not get feedback or something while watching TV. It just uh, requires you to select uh, a television program. And we, when we look at the motivations that users give for watching TV, they're, they're totally different than appearance uh, focused motives. So people watch uh, TV programs because uh, they're in the mood of watching a comedy, like their mood determines the type of program they want to watch, or it is because uh, of a social motive. One of their friends has watched a series and they want to see what the series is about. Um, so with television viewing, it's, it's actually uh, not a manifest motivation for people to select some series because a lot of appearance ideals seem to uh, prevail in uh, a particular television show. Uh, moreover, in one of the yeah, rare longitudinal studies, I have to say on this subject, Aubrey uh, found that over time, people who um, tend to objectify themselves and so do spend a lot of time in monitoring their appearance and, and, and feeling insecure about how they look like, uh, actually started to avoid content on TV that is very much appearance focused. So it, it's, it's even the reverse way um, around. So people who are more preoccupied with their appearance definitely do not seem to select more appearance oriented um, television content. But I do have to say also, this is one of the rare studies who have examined this uh, and we're actually lacking other studies to further examine this pattern. Um, and then, of course, we also have uh, social media. And as we all know, social media is a much more active medium. Um, it requires our own input and we can post uh, pictures, uh, comments ourselves. We can produce appearance focused content ourselves. Um, plus we select more uh, actively who we like to follow on, on these uh, different uh, social media. And here uh, we actually see that it is the case that those uh, users who are more preoccupied with their appearance do uh, engage more in the posting of selfies of themselves, or for instance, spend more time in, in taking multiple selfies uh, so that they can select the best looking selfie to place online. Um, or for instance, we also found in, in one of our studies that um, youth who is more uh, preoccupied with their appearance engaged more in chatting about appearance topics with their friends online on social media. Um, 
So this has, has, has been found in multiple studies that, that if you are more um, yeah, busy with your appearance or more dissatisfied, you're actually also engaged more in appearance focused content. Uh, one study that relates to, the, to this that we recently conducted was a, a longitudinal study that I conducted with some uh, colleagues at the University of Amsterdam, Anna-Marie van Oosten and Jochen Peter. Um, and it was a two-wave panel study with an interval of three months in which we questioned a group of adolescents and emerging adults um, to understand um, more how their own uh, personality and of course also body image drives how they use um, different social media. And here we found that um, especially uh, those who are more dissatisfied with their appearance uh, indicate over time to use social media, especially to get a certain uh, sense of self-validation. So, so this was um, the, the, the labeled motivation. And it means actually that they're seeking confirmation on social media for how they appear. So if you're more dissatisfied also with how you appear, um, you will look for more uh, validation. And as I mentioned before, people who are more dissatisfied also post more selfies. So probably that is a tool through which they seek the validation by posting more selfies. They're possibly anticipating to get uh, some positive feedback from the online network, um, which they believe will help them to feel better. Um, and of course, this gratification led them also over time to use more visually oriented media, meaning that they spend more time on platforms like Instagram, but not, for instance, platforms like uh, Facebook or Twitter, which are known to be used uh, for uh, different reasons than appearance related uh, reasons. We also found that uh, appearance related social media consciousness, and this, this is a, a rather new concept, and it, it's uh, uh, the extent to which people um, feel that their self image or their appearance is, is, is intertwined with social media, and, and they look for uh, getting approval also on social media uh, for how they look like was a driver for um, engaging more on social comparisons uh, on social media and so uh, comparing themselves more, other, more often with others with how they look like on social media, probably to give them feedback uh, again to that appearance related social media consciousness and to position themselves on the social ladder in, in terms of how beautiful they are in, in, in the social media world. Um, so that, that was one study here in which we, we found further proof that it's actually also people's uh, own body image that is driving the kind of interactions they engage in uh, on social media. And of course, if you would um, further continue this chain of events, you would see that, that for instance, th those who are dissatisfied with their body use social media more to get self-validation, but actually this kind of social media uses is known to attract even more attention to their body, which is often a motivator to further feel dissatisfied uh, of one's body. So it's a bit questionable whether this will really help them in uh, attaining uh, a better body image. One of the questions that typically comes up in this kind of research, and, and as a side note also, we did not find any moderation effects here of gender or age, um, but whether this is uh, a problem of mainly girls. Eh? Uh, remember in the beginning of the presentation when I told you there's more than 60% of uh, girls who feel dissatisfied of their body while it's around 35% uh, for boys. Um, and the question is a bit double, like two-sided, I think. Um, on the one hand, yes, um, it is related uh, to gender as, as appearance is part of the traditional gender roles that are still dominant in our society, in which um, women are prescribed to use their appearance to attract a man, but the same is not true for men. Um, it's not a, a major uh, made value for men to be beautiful, while this is true for women. 
Um, you can see that also when we see um, uh, the appearance ideals represented in popular media outlets, uh, many more women comply to the narrowly defined appearance ideals of being thin, um, having low body fat, uh, having a smooth skin and a good hairstyle than it is with male uh, media characters. Um, for men, there are a subsequent proportion that is muscular in these popular media outlets, but still uh, the majority is, is, is not complying to this, this ideal. So there is uh, a bit an imbalance uh, in the prevalence of uh, female versus male appearance ideals that are promoted in, in different popular media outlets. But on the other hand, um, we could definitely say no also because um, as I explained, just there are different appearance ideals for men. Um, we often look at uh, body fat when, when examining uh, the prevalence of uh, appearance ideal, but don't take into account that for men, it's often about muscularity. And, and it's not like that, that every uh, media study seems to take into account um, that muscularity is, is, is the appearance ideal for men. And so that we also need to look at sometimes other uh, outcome variables than those uh, of women. Um, for instance, many uh, studies examine weight dissatisfaction as an outcome variable for media effects. But this is actually not a good outcome for, for men because the weight is not the crucial thing in determining uh, their body image. It's more about the muscular build. Um, so we need other skills sometimes to address um, these problems in men. Um, plus the studies like the one of us that I just explained that um, take into account both uh, men and women, boys and girls often have to conclude that gender does not moderate uh, the effect patterns. So that means that um, if you look at how, for instance, social media affects body dissatisfaction, the, the relationship and its size is the same in boys and girls. What does happen is that the girls are way more often exposed to these appearance ideals overall. And so the cumulative effect is, of course, stronger for them. But when they are both exposed, they are in the same way influenced. It's just that girls are much more exposed. Um, one other thing to take into account is this, of course, um, that men also have to cope or boys with their uh, body image in a world in which um, they're less uh, motivated to show some of their insecurities. And this again relates to those traditional gender roles, um, because for men it's prescribed to not show too much emotions. And so even when they feel unhappy for their, uh, about their body, um, they cannot um, so easily talk about it with their peers and, and receive the peer support that girls do can uh, receive when they experience worries about their appearance. And that's why um, the American Psychological Association uh, some years ago called for a real change in this kind of research. Um, because the discourse is so oriented towards women and girls that we might be missing important effects among these male populations. Um, so I feel also we still have to uh, be a bit patient in terms of how the research will evolve during the next years uh, and taking into account more genuine male-oriented frameworks to understand how these uh, media affects on body image process in men. But we can conclude that um, overall um, appearance focused content on social media and television um, can affect uh, male and females body image in a negative way if they respond uh, with internalization uh, or with uh, upward comparison processes. So then the question, of course, comes, uh, what can we do about this? Like, what is the solution? And uh, when talking about a solution, we can um, go two directions. We can reason in a more top-down way in which we um, change the media industry. <laughs> but um, as you can already predict, this, this, this is less uh, plausible because it would uh, yeah, 
involve uh, all big media companies like Netflix, uh, Facebook and uh, Netflix, who will change how they represent different characters and commit themselves in, in, in uh, abandoning uh, an appearance ideal and promoting uh, more body diversity. Um, sometimes they do efforts, but it, it's not always clear what's the agenda uh, behind the efforts. So typically in research, we look at, at a bottom-up solution in which we try to equip um, some of the um, users with tools um, to respond or to be resilient against um, the promoted uh, appearance ideals. And of course, this is also a bit um, uh, ambiguous, or, or how you, do you phrase it? Because of course, the same users who are already disad like um, have already the disadvantage of, of um, becoming dissatisfied about their bodies by using uh, entertainment media are again called upon uh, their responsibility to now also make sure that they can protect themselves against um, this cumulative exposure of appearance ideals. Um, one way to look at this, like this bottom-up approach, is, is through media literacy, um, in which we actually uh, train uh, media users to become more resilient um, against uh, the narrowly promoted appearance ideals. But here it's difficult because, of course, the exposure to appearance ideals is a lifelong process. Um, in one study with five to seven years old girls, um, they asked them to draw a beautiful or a pretty girl. And you could already see that they understand the body shape that this pretty girl has to have. So the socialization of appearance of the ideal starts very young and children are actually socialized throughout their whole life, not only by media, but sometimes also by their parents or environment into adopting these narrow appearance ideals. So when, when you expose them to a, a media literacy class that lasts approximately two hours, it's a bit too optimistic uh, to expect that they are uh, next equipped uh, with the necessary skills and tools to no longer be harmed by uh, exposure uh, to appearance ideals. It's not like a medicine that you can take um, and that, that uh, cures you afterwards. Um, so it's also a process that takes time. And that is what we have found so far also when testing out different media literacy interventions. Um, there's one well-known study of Homa and colleagues uh, in which they uh, exposed a group of women to um, a media literacy video on appearance ideals. And afterwards, you could see the critical responses growing uh, with women towards uh, these appearance ideals in media and, and like um, criticizing them. But at the same time, there were also responses like, ha, huh, now that I see this, I know it's fake, I know it's unhealthy, but still I'm happy. I'm also having a thin body or some of them also showed signs of self-objectification more. Um, so it, it, it's not like it, it's also triggering or priming um, the appearance ideas that they themselves already have internalized for many years sometimes. Um, and so it cannot like be a total solution against the negative body image. That's why more and more scholars are now looking also at the potential of a positive body image. Um, it's good to realize that a positive body image is not the opposite of a negative body image. It's something that exists in a distinct way next to the dysfunctional negative body image. Um, but it, it, it's a totally different approach for how you can reflect about your body. Um, and in one uh, series of recent study, we started to explore what does this positive body image then means among uh, adolescents. And we conducted for this uh, study that was published in Body Image, um, a focus group, and then next uh, a series of uh, cross-sectional study to develop a measurement instrument to measure uh, a positive body image uh, in adolescents. And we found that it's characterized by four factors. Uh, and the first is, is called body self-appreciation. 
which really um, highlights that you yourself appreciate with how you appear to others, with how you look like, and, and you really value your body. Um, the second one is resilience against uh, body ideals in media. And this is uh, actually uh, more targeting about good coping strategies that some individuals have developed to cope with uh, appearance ideal messages promoted in media. And so um, they know how to respond to these ideals um, and, and to not pay too much attention to them. A similar kind of resilience was found for how people respond to their uh, environment. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, especially for adolescents, the peer culture is very much oriented towards appearance. And so they are confronted with a lot of appearance conversations in their daily lives. And um, this component really hints at, at, at uh, having a healthy way to cope with such conversations and especially when receiving uh, more negative appearance feedback or also more uh, sexualizing comments from your peers. And then the other component is that you, of course, don't only appreciate your own body, but also how others look and the diversity to which others can appear, like the unique different diversity in different bodies, as well as that you hope that, that everyone loves their body uh, for what it is and, and how it looks like and, and that they really show this appreciation towards their body. This kind of, of, of body positive uh, components are also emphasized more and more uh, in popular media uh, outlets and it's called the body positivity movement. And so during the last two years, we uh, focused ourselves a bit on, on understanding how often do these body positivity cues that hint at appreciation of one's own body or of other bodies, as well as showing re resilience towards uh, narrowly defined appearance ideals or negative appearance feedback show up uh, in popular media outlets. And so in a first content analyze, this we um, analyzed some of the most popular brands with youth uh, on social media and um, actually uh, calculated how often they mentioned or, or showed better in their posts um, non-ideal uh, yeah, non models or it's better non-idealized models and more diverse models as well as uh, showed body positivity messages. And here we found that 30% of the posts uh, seem to uh, support the body positivity movements and showed a broader appearance ideal than the narrow uh, appearance ideals. Um, in another study, we then checked whether you'd also really receive these kind of messages and whether they notice them, because we also learned from other uh, studies that influencers also um, include body positivity quotes like love your own body, be unique and, and things like that. Um, and we found indeed that they see them, they notice them. They were uh, indicating in one of our surveys to be multiple times exposed to them uh, in one month. Um, but also they're not themselves like uh, the opinion leaders on this matter because they almost never posted uh, such quotes themselves. And then finally, um, Netflix has uh, released some series. During the last years, in which they also um, start more from a body positivity uh, perspective. And we wanted to see like how uh, in numeric, uh, <coughs> me, more in uh, more uh, detail, like how often these kind of series also promote the body positivity trend. Um, and here we found uh, for the popular shows on Netflix, like sex education, um, that on average uh, in each uh, episode, two body positivity messages uh, occurred. So um, this was very positive also because we actually also coded uh, the negative uh, body image messages that occurred. 
and it was uh, it was I don't think it was significant, but it was even that the body positivity messages appeared slightly more often than the negative body images. So there seemed to be some good changes here. Uh, yet at the same time, we also need to notice that um, the diversity in body size was not really what it should be. Um, 30% of the characters were still thin. Most of them had an average build, build of body size and only 2% was plus size. While uh, in reality among youth, um, it's, it's actually 30% in, in real life uh, population. So there's still an underrepresentation even in these uh, shows of different body sizes. But at least there's there's positive news in, in this way. Um, there is more attention to body positivity on social media and on series uh, like Netflix. Um, some of the work has, has already uh, tested what are now the effects of these uh, body positivity, um, of these different um, representations. Um, and here we see that um, some inconsistent results have been uh, noticed. Some have found positive effects on how you think and feel about your body. Uh, others have reported no effects and um, some others even found negative effects for one's body size. Um, we have to say that, that most of these experiments have been conducted um, in the area of advertising and that were uh, so especially focused on how the diversity, the, the use of more diverse body ideals may empower uh, consumers in an advertising context. Um, so potentially this has something also to do with why um, this didn't work. It can be something about how brands operate and so how, how we should think about these brands. Um, potentially it's different in a social media context when the messages come from influencers, though they're of course also related to brands, we know that. Um, and a final option was that maybe not every body positivity message is the same as um, some may still contain some cues that more relate to a traditional appearance ideal, uh, while other, others do not. And so this was uh, the topic of, of some of the studies uh, we conducted in, in the last years also. Um, I'll quickly summarize um, these results before ending uh, the presentation of today. Um, so in a first survey study, we asked uh, uh, adolescents exposure to these body positive quotes, as well as positive appearance feedback um, that they received from their peers. And here we saw that it was actually um, only the feedback of their peers that helped them in building uh, more appreciation towards their own body, but not really those posts uh, that they receive from influencers. So potentially, yeah, there's something with how they, they approach um, this uh, content on social media that makes it not so genuine uh, to come across. One of uh, other recent uh, studies that have been done um, also hinted that the inclusion of promotional cues uh, in body positivity messages of influencers might explain here uh, that we did not find here a link uh, with adolescents' body appreciation. And then in, as far as the brands, like, uh, is it a good idea for every brand to um, start with uh, promoting body diversity? We looked at, 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 at maybe it's also important to look at the reputation of a brand. Uh, some brands have a more genuine uh, appreciation of a diversity of bodies than others, like Ebert Crombie has been criticized repeatedly for their focus on narrow appearance ideals. Well, this is uh, absolutely not the case for ASOS. ASOS, that is a very more uh, broad uh, brand. And in one of the experiments we conducted uh, with women, we found that indeed um, you saw that, that um, respondents responded much more positive uh, to ASOS uh, when they used uh, a non-ideal model in one of their advertising campaign than when Ebert, Crombie and Fitch uh, does this. They do not 
perceive it as as authentic when when a company does it with a, a reputation of actually promoting um yeah narrow appearance ideals they rather see it as a kind of a response to the increasing pressure uh of the fact that they're uh, promoting only these narrow uh, appearance ideals and so um it also uh, affected uh, the uh, intention that they wanted to buy something of that brand in which they were much more positively affected when Asus did it than when Abercrombie and Fitch uh, worked with a, a plus model. Um, interestingly, these studies also showed no effect on, on individuals' feelings about the campaign overall or their uh, body image. Uh, probably this short-term exposure is not enough to really uh, affect someone's body uh, image about um, yeah, how they feel about their body. And then in the final um, uh, study, we also wondered whether it depends on how you portray the body, because if you're showing um, an average or plus size model, you can do it in very different ways. And part of the literature is also focused on self-objectification. And this objectification theory says that when you ask someone to take on a sexualized perspective on their appearance, um, it's actually also harmful for one's body image. And we found that some of, of, of these plus size or, or average size models also uh, actually take a very uh, appearance-oriented focus towards their body. Um, while others took, took another uh, position or perspective. And so here we, we wondered whether when you uh, present your body as something very passive with a focus on how you appear uh, would differ from the effects that you see when you show body love through presenting your body, body as a very active um, yeah, instrument to say, and you focus on, on what your body can do and your appreciation is is, is for what your body does, uh, for instance, when you're running or something, uh, versus when you approach it also from a more personality kind of uh, perspective, like your body is part of your personality and you have a strong personality and you appreciate the total package, let's say, and this is body love, uh, whether this can, can result in different effects. Um, and here we found that uh, ads working with this uh, passive object uh, performed worse in terms of uh, ad effectiveness um, than the ones who used an active body uh, frame versus the one who used that personality kind of frame. Again, interestingly, no effects came uh, on the different body image outcomes that we examined. And here we expect again that it's, it's a short term exposure. We expose them to these different ads for like a, a minute or something, um, that this is not enough to trigger uh, true body image outcomes. So uh, to wrap up, um, I think the, uh, the area of body positivity is, is very uh, promising, um, but it's good to keep in mind that there are uh, conditions related to when uh, body positivity exert uh, the positive influences on one's positive body image that we would like to see. And that I, I, I would say it's important for us scholars to learn more about how we also can use media to empower people in their body image. So thank you for listening. Um, and I'm hoping we can discuss some more now. Thank you very much for this great presentation. Seems like a very difficult issue to study. Uh, lots of unknowns there. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of complexities um, involved in, in, in the link between media and body image. <laughs> uh, so do we have any questions? Well, I have some if there is no volunteers right now. Uh, so one thing uh, I'm curious about is you, you mentioned uh, about this mechanism that um, people who are more and more concerned about their body image would tend to seek more uh, validation in social media, which would then reinforce the body image concerns. Is mm -hmm. that, that? Yeah. 
is this sort of like a, is this a, are there similar similarities with the addiction here like with hmm. sounds to me a bit like you know what happens with people when they do drugs in the sense that the more they do the more they need uh, or would you say there are some clear differences here huh <laughs> i think addiction is a totally other field also so i i'm a bit hesitant uh, to compare it to to addiction because this is a total other disorder i would say like it's it's something different and plus we're talking here about people um it's not pathological samples so to speak like it's 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 um average populations and and the scores on body dissatisfaction um plus also on how often they use social media for gratifying these appearance needs they're still within an acceptable range like it's not taking over their their uh, daily life because otherwise we come into uh, the case of eating disorders i would say and and this is of course still um yeah a subpopulation it's a clinical sample so it's it's something different and and i think it's good to keep in mind that with most um media users it just remains within the reflections of and and of course it's 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 very negative to to have a a, a negative body image but it should be seen as as something different from from like an eating disorder um or i think also like an addiction that completely takes over your your uh, daily functioning um so i, I think it, it it's it's of course um we see with media that that how your uh, your identity will shape how you consume your media and what you get out of different media interactions it, it's a reinforcing cir circle uh, so to say um, and i think that's more illustrated when we look at these reciprocal relationships is that it's a part of your identity uh, how you seek out certain interactions but also these interactions again shape some part of your identity and this again yeah will reinforce then how you use it see thank you and when you ask people in surveys for example about their motivation to go on social media and post photos is, is that how the research is conducted i'm I'm curious here about how much of this is actually conscious. Uh, I mean, the motivation for, uh, you know, posting photos. Uh. The, it's, it's um, I think like in service, yes, we explicitly ask it uh, whether they post photos to receive uh, validation of their appearance. Like it's quite literally like that. But it's good to know that we have done also a, a lot of focus groups with youth. Uh, to talk about how they deal with appearance and they're quite knowledgeable about this um it's also like it's it's not only in social media terms it's not only appearance but it's also um there's also bias in positively representing yourself in other areas like school performances popularity um so they're very much aware that social media um at least the public presentations and here i mean the things you post on your instagram uh, stories and 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 wall that they're they're oriented towards uh, a bigger audience and you're you're very selective in how you present yourself to that audience like it's a bit the norm to positively present yourself and so it is somewhat biased not only in terms of appearance um but like it's it's a thing also with with adolescent girls to meet up and and take multiple selfies and then together select uh the best one to post on social media uh some girls even indicate um they feel pressured when their best friend posts something online to give it a positive appearance comment because it's important uh for girls um so it, it's something they're very much aware of so they, they can really identify it in in survey research uh, and understand what the items mean i would say um and it's in, it's it's interesting because they are actually very critical um but still it doesn't protect themselves from feeling uh, from times to time uh, dissatisfied about these uh, promoted ideals 
Say thank you. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Uh, whether we are able to conduct any historical comparisons, if there's any data to check how body image changed within the last, for example, 50 years, or if it's such a fresh topic that it was not researched back then. Oh, um, it's a good, yeah. I have to think, like, I think it's definitely already going on for quite a long time, this research. But I would say it's really it really kicked off uh, extensively in the in the nineties years. So you could definitely go for thirty years, I think, uh, to see. But of course now the media changed in 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 ways that you now have also social media, which was not available uh, some years uh, or ten years or fifteen years maybe already. <laughs> I don't dare to say uh, ago. Um, plus. Um, yeah, I guess television also changed. Eh? The more programs that came available with streaming services, you can now have much more tailored um, programs that you like to watch. Um, what you do have is maybe uh, research in comparing over time how the body image ideal, like the narrowly defined ideal changed. And there, there's a well-known study that did that, for instance, for men with action dolls that are uh, promoted to boys and in which you can see how the doll gets <laughs> uh, more muscular and mus muscular over the years. Uh, and there's one other study, if I'm not mistaken, with uh, the Playboy magazine, like the center folds that you could get out of the magazines like it used to be. Um, that also has done that for body size in which you do see the evolution of the ideal becoming more thinner. I would say that, that the, the, the curvaceous ideal that, that I mentioned before, like with Kim Kardashian, that's something that, that changed over the years also because you had Kate Moss uh, more than 10 years ago, but now we evolved towards a more uh, busted and, and well-shaped uh, female ideal. So there are some changes, I, I would say, that have been documented in the literature in how the ideal looks like. But I wouldn't, I, I don't know whether you can really compare whether the effects have become stronger or, or, or not, uh, because the media has changed so much over the years. I hope that answers somewhat your question. Uh, if, if I may also uh, add to that by asking, and is it known how much the statistics change on how many people and youths are concerned about their bodies? Has this changed over the years? Is it like getting better, worse, or? Oh, I, I don't that I don't dare to say by heart because I, I think it's 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 also because it's partly embedded also I would say in their developmental period that I do think you will always have a substantial part that that is dissatisfied um, because it's it's part of the challenges they're facing when growing up and seeing their body changing so it's it's also um i think part yeah of course um facilitated by these developmental tasks that that you easily uh receive a, a bigger uh, dissatisfied group than you would have with with adults uh let's say uh, but I, I'm not aware of those, those studies. I would need to check. Sure. So do we have any other questions? If you prefer, you can just type them in the chat. Well, I, I can go on if that's OK. <laughs> uh, it's very interesting. There's just so many issues here and there. So. Um, I wanted to ask you about the teaching media literacy. So am I correct in understanding that the findings so far are just ambiguous and there's no like, is there like one clear result that for some, that would indicate something actually works? There uh, are some, there's one experiment in, in media literacy that found some positive results, um, but it also depends a bit on which component of the body image you're targeting. So, like I said, like in the, in the Homa study, uh, you saw them becoming more critical, like seeing more that it's photoshopped and, and that it's unrealistic. Like 
uh, yeah, evolving in, in this critical knowledge, but at the same time, it didn't change their core body image components. And they even started to self-objectify more, which is not so surprisingly, because during this literacy training, they show all of these idealized models and tell you like, this is unnatural, like most women don't look like that, or it's exceptional or this or that. But at the same time, you are confronted that it's something exceptional and it's well valued in the society. So you have very different ways that you can look at this kind of literacy trainings. Um, and, and, and so it's, it's not unlogical, let's say, that that part of the woman responded with these kind of responses. Um, and that's why we now seem, or like we as a group at least, focus now more on the body positivity movement because we, we see more potential maybe in it because it, it's, it's a cumulative process that takes uh, place over years and, and that can really broaden up uh, the messages you encounter in your daily life. Um, and so we're actually hoping that, that, that they can really change also these core components um, of the body image beyond just knowing that it's not healthy to aspire uh, a, a thin ideal, for instance, a thin body, but also actually changing that you do no longer want to aspire such a thin ideal. Um, but again, there with the body positivity, one thing we directly noticed when, when looking at these messages was that influencers with very narrowly shaped uh, bodies, let's say, and who, who totally comply to the appearance ideal, started posting quotes like love your body and then showing a highly sexualized picture in which you are like, this is not what the body positivity movement should look like. Um, it, it's not intended for these kind of posts. And, and that's now what we're trying uh, to identify a bit is, is that um, we have to get those ambiguous messages out of it um, to really have the body positivity movement. So I imagine this is very tricky, right? Because I'd imagine there's some people who don't just try not to think about this very much, but then when you start talking to them about body image, then whatever message you're trying to convey, they're going to start about thinking about their bodies and might not might react negatively in the end. Is, is this? Yeah, yeah, that, that's part of it also, I guess. Um, but of course, some messages evoke appreciation about your body as yeah? showing your body in, in like physical exercise and appreciating your body uh, for what it can do. Uh, for instance, how, how, yeah, how good or how fit you feel after a yoga class or a running session. Um, that's, that's the kind of appreciation we want to obtain with people with their body. And that, that's really part of body positivity. So thinking about your body can also be positively, but it should be about yeah, the right components, let's say, like how it's functioning and not like it cannot even be about how you look like, but it cannot be contrasted against a narrow thin ideal. So we, we have to get that 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 standard, let's say, um, out of people's minds to 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 have a more uh, broad vision about what can be beautiful. You're beautiful because you feel self-assured in your body, that, that should be a kind of standard more than um, the thin or the muscular ideal. And perhaps one final question for, from me, if I may. <laughs> uh, so is there any role for parents here? Like, because uh, I mean, yeah. they could do sort of media, media literacy teaching in a more continuous way. And is was this a topic of studies or? Yeah, know? in the beginning, parents were also questioned, but it, it's good to be <laughs> realistic or aware of it, that parents also have internalized the narrow appearance ideas and that they, like, especially mothers are known to uh, keep appearance conversations with their children in which they uh, re-emphasize these narrow appearance ideals. So of course, uh, it's a good first step to not model uh, strict dieting behaviors and things like that as, as a parent yourself. Um, 
And in terms of, of media literacy, we saw in one of our other studies that was not only about appearance ideals uh, on social media, but also on, on like the general drive of youth to uh, especially post positively biased messages, not only about appearance, but also how they're performing at schools, their friends, popularity, um, that when parents approach their, their children more to talk about what they uh, had seen on social media uh, and to really have conversation about what they do on social media, that these children became more critical towards the content they processed on, on social media and got uh, improved regulation strategies in how to deal with uh, such idealized content. Um, so this shows some promise in, in that parents should talk about social media with their children. And um, the next step here now is, is, is that we're unsure actually that, that parents are uh, very much aware of all of the things that are going on on social media, but potentially they don't need, even need to be like if they're just talking with their children about it and helping them interpreting what they see on these social media, that may even already be sufficient, like they don't need to be an expert, let's say, in this matter to give some good guidance. Um, that, that's at least, our, at least our hypothesis at the moment, so that, that will be a next step in this research. Well, that's good to hear that there's room for some influence there. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Mm, and is there any like uh, relationship between the body image of the parents and the body image concerns of the of their children? Yes, definitely. That that's been well um, shown in the body body image literature that. Yeah, parents that are more dissatisfied about their uh, own bodies, they model these kind of behaviors in the everyday life, of course, which children can observe and, and next adopt also. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. So, do we have uh, other questions perhaps? Uh, well, if not, then uh, I think we can conclude. Uh, thank you very much again for this presentation. Uh, I think it was very informative um, and a very interesting research area. Like I imagine it, lots of challenges there, so it's very impressive. We still uh, have some work to do, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and probably by the time you like you learn everything that is to learn right now the digital landscape will change in <laughs> to give more challenges right absolutely so we can keep going on <laughs> <laughs> All so right. thank, you. thank you very much again thank you thank you for the invitation have a nice afternoon all thank you you too